As I said, we can go rather slowly. I want to revise. This is because we are having a philosophical exposition of the theme of life divine. If it were some other exposition, we could have very brief statement. The brief statement could be that we are here on the earth to manifest the divine consciousness in the physical life. And let us work on it. And the question will be only to find out the means by which we can do it. Then our attention would be on the process by which we can do it. But since this statement, that we are here on the earth for the manifestation of divine consciousness in physical life, is a philosophical statement. We have to consider how do you know that we are here on the earth for the manifestation of divine consciousness in physical life? And how are we sure that this is so? Not only how do we know, but how are we sure that this is so? Now some people might say, we are sure because we have been told by our teachers that this is so. This kind of an argument may satisfy many people. But then that is not a philosophical answer. Even if it may satisfy one or two or many, there will be still many people in the world who would not be satisfied. And you will have to converse with them in due course of time. Therefore, even if you dispense with philosophical discussion on the subject, sooner or later you will have to be engaged in a philosophical discussion with others who will demand a philosophical answer. As Sri says, intellectual approach can be dispensed with by some or by many. But it cannot be dispensed with if we are to deal with this problem on the scale of humanity. If it is only a few individuals, you can dispense with this question. But if it is a question of dealing with humanity, and if this message is to be given to humanity and not to X, Y, Z, and if we are also interested in answering this question to humanity, then intellectual approach is indispensable. It is for this reason that we have undertaken this task. For ourselves to have a philosophical assurance of this proposition. And in due course to empower ourselves to be able to answer this question to many others in humanity who will ask this question. It is for this reason that we are studying the Life Divine. Because the Life Divine has been written in answer to this important issue. To give to ourselves a philosophical assurance that our life here is meant for manifestation of Divine Consciousness in 
full manifestation in the direct physical consciousness. Sri Aurobindo says that the aim of this book is to give to ourselves a rational assurance that divine life on the earth is indispensable, it is inevitable, and that each one of us has to participate in it and has to participate in it with deliberate cooperation, with our willing free cooperation, and the sooner we do it, the better it is for everyone. We have already made a journey in this process. We have read the first four chapters. And before we come to the fifth chapter, I think we need to recapitulate. Because fifth chapter is one of the most difficult chapters in the book. It has a recapitulation of the first four chapters. It introduces new elements. And these new elements are introduced on the supposition that the reader is well equipped to receive these new elements which are now being introduced. So let us first of all recapitulate what you have done so far. You can see that this word human aspiration has three significances. One is that all philosophical thinking rests upon aspiration. This connection between philosophical thinking and aspiration is extremely important. Why Shirobindo begins with human aspiration is because it's a philosophical book. And if human aspiration and philosophical thinking are inevitably connected with each other, it is best to start with a particular connection. It is by human aspiration that all philosophical thinking can be justified. Why do we think philosophically at all? Because of aspiration. Why? Because philosophical thinking is a search for meaning, is a search for essential significance. And significance is related to aspiration. It is because of aspiration that we are looking for significance. If there was no aspiration, there will be no looking for significance and therefore no philosophical thinking at all. Therefore, to start with human aspiration is the inevitable starting point of philosophical work. Many books on philosophy do not start with it. They start with something else. But you cannot say that these other beginnings which are made in philosophical works have got their inevitability. The inevitable connection with aspiration and significance being present and as significance being connected with philosophical thinking. Therefore, a philosophical book can best be started with a statement of aspiration. Now, aspiration is to be determined. What is it that man aspires for? Now, one could have asked the question, what does the universe aspire for? And that is not the question that Sri Aurobindo asks. It could have been 
what is the whole world aspiring for. Sri Aurobindo marks out only one that actually speaking the aspiration is fundamentally to to be found among human beings. Even if it is present everywhere in the world, it is a human being, it becomes more manifest. And it is human being, whether he likes it or not, is making effort to satisfy his aspiration. The central point of the world is this. Therefore, Sharabhita speaks of the human aspiration. Now, that human aspiration he defines in four terms. Man aspires for God, light, freedom, immortality. Being a philosophical work, you have to ask, is it really true? Is it inevitable fact that man is aspiring? Or is it an assumption? In philosophical thinking, all assumptions are to be questioned. Even if you start with a supposition, in due course of time, that supposition will have to be questioned and to be answered. Now, Sri Aurobindo, because he starts with human aspiration, he makes it sure that the very first proposition is supportable by human history. So he starts by stating that the earliest preoccupation of man in his awakened thought also seems to be the highest. You look at the whole history of mankind, he admits that this aspiration has not been constant. There are times when this aspiration ceases to be very operative. There are periods of skepticism, agnosticism, vital seeking and many other things. But Sri says that even after those periods, short or long, human being returns back with his aspiration. Therefore, there is something so fundamental in this aspiration that our whole history of mankind can be regarded as one big cry. As if man is constantly looking for God, life, freedom, immortality. Or prominently asking, if not constantly, prominently asking for it. How do you know mankind right from the beginning has been doing it? So Sri Aurobindo says, look at the earliest records of man's aspiration. The Veda is the earliest record of it. And in these records we do find this aspiration writ large. How do you say it is also likely to be because Sri Aurobindo says that even now we are passing through a period of skepticism, materialism, denial of this aspiration. But at the end of this journey, we find that mankind is satiated with whatever he has been doing at present, but not satisfied, and therefore trying to return to this primal longing. Now those who have read the history of mankind will be able to justify the statement. Those who have not read the history of mankind, we are not fit to study this book because it is the background that is necessary to be able to appreciate the statement. Because people who have not studied history of mankind thoroughly well, he may not be impressed by this statement at all. 
A person, for example, who has not read Khan, may not feel so much struck by these four words which Shurabindu brought out. Because Kant is not a very old thinker. He is one of the new thinkers, modern thinkers. And he is one of the most prominent thinkers of our times. And whether one agrees with Kant or not, all philosophers of today have got to take cognizance of this philosopher. <coughs> and this philosopher happens to say that in the ultimate analysis there are three postulates which you cannot question or even if you question you are bound to come back to them and he says God, freedom, immortality. This is his conclusion. We need not go into his whole philosophy, how he has come to this conclusion. But at least from historical point of view, it is a fact that this great philosopher of the 19th century came to the conclusion after studying the whole gamut of knowledge. Actually, he is supposed to have given a tremendous book called Critic of Pure Reason and Critic of Practical Reason. And having examined reason in all its aspects, he has come to the conclusion that there are three important aspirations of man which are unquestionable. God, freedom, immortality. And they are not only postulated, but he says they are inescapable. Ultimately, you have got to believe in God. You have got to believe in freedom. You have got to believe in immortality. And philosophically, you are bound to do it. Mind you, he is the one philosopher who has given criticisms of the proofs of existence of God. In our most recent times, if there is one philosopher who has criticized the proofs of existence of God, it is Kant. But having criticized those proofs, he has got his own proof. So he could not escape it. And he has concluded that we are obliged to accept the existence of God, accept the existence of freedom of man, and we are obliged to accept that man must be immortal. These three statements, he said, are inescapable. Now, it so happens that these are the three prominent words also in the Veda. It so happens. It's not something contrived. If you read the Veda, you find these three, state, three words constantly appearing. God, light, freedom, immortality. All the time. Now, this is not a historical accident. Kant had not come to this conclusion after reading the Veda and all that. And Veda had not read Kant to make, make this proposition. It so happens, objectively speaking, if you look at the history of the world, you find that the Vedic Rishi spoke of God, light, freedom, immortality. Whatever be his reasons, Rishis did not inquire into pure reason and all that and came to this conclusion. Modern time, we are inquiring into reason critically and all that. Even then, our conclusion has been the same. It's a very palpable fact. So, Sherubindo says that whether we look at the past, remote past, or we read the latest one, the aspiration of man is found to be described so vividly in a short formula. God, light, rhythm, immortality. Now, this is the aspiration of man. Now, Sri Aurobindo says, this aspiration also happens to be its last. 
happens to be its last. But Sri Aurobindo says, he promises to be its last. Mm -hmm. That word promise is very important. It doesn't say it is the last. Why? Because it's a philosophical statement. Unless you have proved that it must be the last, it is the last, it's only a kind of promise. Why is it that it is continuously going on the whole history of mankind? Therefore, it promises to be last. Of course, the philosopher himself has full reason to believe it is the last. But when he is expounding, he has not yet proved. Therefore, the only good word that he can be used for that purpose is that he promises to be last. As I said, the very first paragraph has got two important statements. One statement which is qualified by the word seems and one statement which is qualified by the word is. And in philosophical terms, these two words are very important. Seems is only a probability and is is a definitive conclusion. So I had said that Sri Aurobindo in the very first paragraph, he uses both the, both the statements. He says that this aspiration seems to be the last, promises to be the last. But he also says, he is also the highest that thought can envisage. Now there is a distinction between the two. You can say a conclusion to be probable if you have a historical argument. A historical argument cannot end in inevitability because historically nothing is inevitable. The conclusion that you derive from any historical account about the future can be only promising, at the most probable. Therefore, as long as the historical argument is there, he uses the word seems, promises. But when he comes to the question of asking whether this aspiration is definitively in consonance with the highest reasoning, this connection, Sri Aurobindo says, is an inevitable connection in thought. I had said this, this first statement where the word is is used is a part of ontological argument. That God is the highest that thought can envisage. In ontological argument does not say that God seems to be the highest. Ontological argument says God is the highest. Therefore, where Sri Aurobindo is stating the ontological argument, he uses the word is. Where he is using historical argument, he uses the word seems. The upshot of the first paragraph is only this, that human aspiration can best be defined in terms of God, life, freedom, immortality. It is the highest that thought can be envisaged. Therefore, as far as the intellectual thought is concerned, it is inescapable. As far as historical process is concerned, it is likely that this is going to be the last one. Having said it, perhaps No question may remain in the mind of a student. You can simply say, I am now convinced that I must now work for aspiration, the fulfillment of the aspiration. But that may not be true of every student, every reader. He might say, your conclusion is that this is going to happen, likely it's going to happen, likely to be fulfilled, how can you say it is bound to be fulfilled? 
this bound to be fulfilled is a further proposition that is being proposed in the whole book. The whole book is written only to show rationally that this aspiration is bound to be fulfilled. <coughs> so there is still a big distance between the proposition which is made that this is likely to continue, this aspiration is likely to continue and it is bound to be fulfilled. Therefore, a lot of argumentation is <coughs> You might say the whole book is only an answer to this question. How can you show, how can you demonstrate rationally that this is bound to happen? If we want to prove this statement, we have to determine the steps of proving this statement. The proposition is that there is a consciousness which is called divine consciousness. Divine is to be realized. When we say aspiration for God, it means that I am aspiring for God to be realized. So there must be an assertion that God exists. I have to prove that God exists. If God is to be manifested in bodily life, then body must exist. In other words, matter must exist. I have to prove second statement, matter exists. If spirit is to manifest in matter, then I have to further prove that matter is capable of manifesting spirit. Not only matter should exist, but should be capable material nature should be such. In other words, I have to prove that there is no fundamental conflict between spirit and matter. If by very nature spirit is one thing and matter is quite different, if they are in constant conflict with each other, then the proposition is unworkable. So I have to prove that matter must be capable it must not be in conflict with spirit. Thirdly, I have also to show that matter and life, I want to manifest God in physical life. Therefore, matter and life also must be somehow reconcilable with each other. I have to manifest God not only in life but in physical life. Therefore, there should be no conflict between God and life, life and matter. Further, if there is any distance between God and life and matter, and yet I believe that God will be in matter, then if there is a distance, then that distance should be coverable. If it is not coverable, then my proposition cannot be true. Now in history of thought, all these propositions have been denied. And that is my big problem. 
which he said by some god does not exist some say matter does not exist some say that life and matter are bound to be conflict with each other for some time they can come together but not forever because everyone dies ultimately so matter is more powerful than life therefore the wedding of life and matter is not possible divorce is the only answer ultimately according to some god exists matter exists but they are so different so far away from each other that this distance can't be covered therefore the whole idea that god can manifest in matter and material life is impossible and there are many other intermediate denials of various kinds so unless i meet each one of these denials i have cannot be said to have proved by thesis merely by saying that human aspiration has been constant merely on that ground i cannot say it must happen merely by wish will not prove it must happen and there are many wishes in the world which don't work in the world so merely wish is not an argument even if i say that my thought cannot and be say higher than this even if i am certain about it argument could be that there are many things about which thought is very certain but in life it doesn't work therefore merely to say in thought it is inevitable it doesn't follow it is bound to happen in material life Now all these arguments I must meet squarely. Now Sri Aurobindo, in the very first chapter, deals with all these questions rapidly and securely. In the very first chapter. and there are mainly three arguments one is that there is a complete contradiction between what is actual and what is aspired for aspiration for god life to the immortality is an aspiration is an ideal but actuality has nothing of god in it nothing of light in it nothing of immortality here and what is obtained will always remain so you can dream but what is going to happen in the world is only what is here <clears throat> this is an argument which is put forward so shervindo raises a metaphysical argument what is a metaphysical argument a metaphysical argument is the argument which seeks a significance meaning so shervindo says if there is a contradiction between the actual and the ideal we must ask the question why is there this contradiction merely saying there is a contradiction is not enough metaphysically you have to answer the question why 
why is it at all that in spite of the fact that actually is only this much, why man goes mad and looks after for these things? What is the significance of this? Therefore, Sharabindu says that if we look deliberately, this deliberate reason is the metaphysical reason. Reason is that which is an attempt to ask if there is any reason behind it. After all, what is rationality? Rationality is to look for reason. So you must ask the question, what is the reason of this discrepancy between the actual and the ideal? Even if I am mad in aspiring for God, I have to explain how that madness happens in this world. I have got to explain why, what is the significance of this contradiction. And you have to answer this question metaphysically. No metaphysical thinker can avoid this question. If he is a real philosopher, he has got to answer this question. As I have said, metaphysical, metaphysical thinking by its very nature <coughs> is a search for the significance. If you don't ask significance, then there is no metaphysical thinking at all. Close the door. You say, I am not going to discuss this question philosophically.